Hey everyone, it's Barry here. Hope you enjoy the episode and visit us at barrykibrick.com to become part of our community of patrons. I've always been curious what it would feel like if I knew what I wanted to do when I was a young boy. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick, and I didn't even give it much serious thought until after I graduated college. Today, though, I will get some insight on what that must be like when I speak with Leonard Maltin. As many of you know, Leonard is one of the most recognized and respected film critics of our time. And our conversation, focusing on his book, Hooked on Hollywood, is about a young boy of 13 who at that age knew what he was destined to do. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. Leonard, I have been watching and reading your work well, since I was a little boy, which is what we'll start with. Thank you so much for sharing the set with me today. Well, I'm happy to be here, Barry. It's my pleasure. Uh, in fact, that's what I want to start with. At, you got the bug at 13 years old. Yeah. You were bitten by this. And I was always very curious when a young person knows that he's destined for something. Well, uh, to take the, the chronology back just a little, I was either seven or eight when my parents took me to see a film at the Guild Theater in Manhattan, which was just behind Radio City Music Hall. It's the movie theater, it looks like it's a mistake. <laughs> it's <laughs> now a shoe store or something. But we went to see a film called The Golden Age of Comedy. It was a compilation of great silent comedy footage with Laurel and Hardy and lots of the other giants of that era and some of the lesser known comedians too and it was love at first sight. I'd seen some of those things on TV already, but not on a big screen. And I remember outside the theater was a, a giant standee of Laurel and Hardy with Jean Harlow in a film uh, that she made with them called Double Whoopee. And I remember, as if it was yesterday, I remember that standee, I remember going into that theater. And that's when I first got turned on and went to my local library. I was already a precocious reader and tried to find books about that period. And there was very little. This is a long time ago. It was very little. There was one, Max Sennett's autobiography called King of Comedy. I took it home and devoured it. Devoured it. And as I did with several subsequent books, I took it home, read it, read it twice, brought it back, checked it back in, and then took it out again. So I didn't, I didn't break any rules. I may have bent them just a little bit, but, uh, and uh, I couldn't get enough. But it was and then at, at 13. At 13, I, got, I was. Oh, that's what I, I was saw, going. At 13, you started writing. Yes, and saw my name in print uh, for the first time, in, not in my own little fanzine, but in some other magazine. Well, then you did start. You, you started publishing your yep. own work right after that. Yeah, yeah, I did. And uh, I worked with a mimeograph machine, a foul contraption I hope never to encounter again. Oh, but you must admit, wait a minute, Leonard, the smell. Yeah, the smell. The it's smell. A, I mean, I can still remember the smell the of more, those mimeograph machines. The more machines. potent smell was with the Ditto machine, which was the oh. purple ink one. Oh, that's the, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yes. The Ditto machine, you're right. That's the one I'm thinking and, of. And uh, they used that in my school. That's the one. I inherited from a cousin of my father's a, an old used mimeograph machine, which was, I think there still may be ink under my fingernails <laughs> from that experience. But it was a way of making duplicate, you know, in those days there wasn't a Kinko's or a, you know, uh, an office store on every other corner where you could make Xeroxes or photocopies. That was still, it was just on the cusp of happening, but it wasn't available to me. So that's, I, I used the technology at hand. But then what's, what's amazing is you're 13, you start this. You just get your name in print. Yeah. Within a year, you're publishing your own stuff. And then at 15, if I read this correctly, two, well, no, film. Film Fan Monthly. Film Fan Monthly. They want you to take over. 
the well, or at least begin publishing the publication. All right, you'll, you'll relate to this uh, <laughs> as a fellow baby boomer. I used to read avidly Forrest Ackerman's famous monsters of film land, as did every, I think especially boys, as did every uh, red-blooded boy of our generation. And like Stephen King, Steven Spielberg, they all grew up on Famous Monsters magazine. And one month, he published a, a, a guide to fanzines. Now today, this would all be websites and blogs and right. you know, other kinds of Facebook and things. But back then, in the Cro-Magnon era, uh, it was published, these were published magazines, be they on a lowly mimeograph machine or but from a professional printer. And I saw two that caught my eye, one was the 8 millimeter Collector, which turned out to be published by a furniture dealer in Indiana, Pennsylvania, who was lonely because there was no one, no one there to talk to about his love of silent films. He used this as a vehicle to reach out to other collectors of silent film. Then there was one in Vancouver called Film Fan Monthly. I submitted articles unsolicited uh, to both of them, not telling them how old I was. And they both accepted them. And then when I told them I was 13, they said, well, we don't care. Oh. And the guy in Vancouver said, well, I'm 19. <laughs> and two years later, I, so I started becoming a regular, regular contributor to both of these. And two years later, Daryl Davey, the man who was doing Film Fan Monthly, said, you know, I've got a full-time job now, and I just don't have the time to devote to this anymore, but I've invested five years of my life in it. I don't want to see it just die. Would you like to take it over? And to make a long story very short, I did. And for the next nine years, I edited and published Film Fan Monthly. In the earlier period, I wrote most of it. Then I did start to get some contributors. I also licked stamps, stuffed envelopes, schlepped to the post office, the whole nine yards. But as you say, school had to take a back seat now. Yes, <laughs> You it did. were on your mission already. I was. I was. I did know what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be, if not specifically the area I wanted to, to be, be working. And so I didn't understand why I had to take advanced calculus. What is this going to do? In my, what relevance has this to my life? And I kept placing into advanced math <laughs> and, and, and then flunking. And they say, well, your aptitude test shows you're capable of doing this. You're just not applying yourself. No, I'm not, because I don't get it. <laughs> oh. Oh, you know, Leonard, in the book, you do something interesting, because it's part memoir. Mm -hmm. It's part of what we, I would call the most eclectic interviews mm -hmm. I've ever seen, and also some of the most kind of bizarre reviews of films in a certain way, some of them We'll start with like the best one, and, and that's Casablanca. You, you open your book, but it's not so much about the film as it is the music. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting for such a visual medium, even though we all know mm -hmm. how much sound plays in it. It was the music that after, as you said, I think it was too many times to mention that you've seen it, you kept still noticing yeah. something new. That I'd never noticed before. Uh, I was lucky. The first time I saw it, I was a teenager, and there was a big Bogart revival at that time. And during the counterculture era of the late 60s, early 70s, Bogart was adopted by uh, young people as kind of the ultimate anti-hero. And of course, in films like Casablanca, he was. So uh, I got to see that in a theater with an audience on a big screen for the first time, and I fell in love. So I've seen it countless times since on TV, on video, on DVD, Blu-ray, you name it. But one time I was sur channel surfing and I came upon it on Turner Classic Movies and I lingered as I often do and I realized, wait a minute, they're playing Cole Porter's Love for Sale in the background on the piano and then there's It Had to Be You which they sing for a little while. Now, everybody knows as time goes by is associated with that film. And there's some fil a couple of songs featured in the movie. Dooley Wilson does a song called Knock on Wood. You know, La the Marseillaise scene is very famous. But there's a whole bed of music all through that movie. 
And I thought, this is something that no one's ever really explored before. So I went to the Warner Brothers archives at USC here in Los Angeles, where they have the complete production records. When I say complete, Warner Brothers had it on their stationery. I hope I quote this right. Put it in writing. Verbal communication causes confusion. That was the, the byword of the studio. So there, as, as a result, there's this great paper trail of memos. Memos as well as letters and contracts and production reports and all that. So you can trace every day, literally, uh, of this movie's life. Well, you know, that's what, that's what your book is like. I don't yeah, want to know yeah. that. It really is because you do that with, I'll, I'll tell you, now let's go to a movie that is nowhere near as famous, but the song is, at, well, was that Blues in the Night? Blues no. in the Night. Blues yeah. in the Night. And you, I want to just quote a line that you gave, gave from Sammy, Sammy Khan, if I might. Yeah. He's, you asked, when asked which came first, the music or the words, the Oscar-winning lyricist Sammy Khan always answered the phone call. Yep. I thought that was, that was insight right there. Nothing really begins in show business until the business exactly. starts. As he used to say, who would write a song called Love is a Many Splendored Thing or Three Coins in the Fountain unless you were commissioned to do that? It started with the phone call. Now, there is also... I guess uh, I'm going to read it, and I, I guess I have to read it because I, I, I won't remember it. You ask these questions on a disaster film, and when I say a disaster, I mean a disaster of a film called mm -hmm. On Your Toes. Right. And you ask this question, how could a 1936 Broadway musical hit become a 1939 movie flop? And the answer is, they took out all the music, had a dancer that couldn't dance, nothing was the same, and you just research this all the way, like you did with Casablanca, to see how does something like this happen. And I wanted to say that the machinations and machinations of Hollywood still are the same, aren't they? Yes, yeah, some things haven't changed at all. Uh, there are times that studios will buy a property. Maybe it's a comic book, maybe it's a play, or a novel, uh, or anything from any medium you can, you can name. And then they throw away all the things that made that successful or appealing. And of course, some things really belong in the medium where they, where they first show themselves. Uh, a chorus line, perfect example. One of the great American musical theater experiences, seeing a chorus line. For 10 years, they tried to make a movie out of it. People like Mike Nichols walked off the project. He said, it isn't going to work. It doesn't, doesn't lend itself to a movie. It, you have to see it happening in that moment on stage. There's electricity in the air. And you can't quite duplicate that on film. And uh, look, I, I love movies, but I love theater too. And th that's the magic of theater. But you say something funny about duplicating. When they went from the silence to the talkies, you didn't say that they made sequels. You said that they actually made even exact copies, yep. even after they made the talkie, they'd make another talkie because sound was even better, and it was the exact same movie. It wasn't a sequel. It was yeah. almost as if you were back with your mimeograph machine. Yeah, yeah. They were just copying it verbatim. Well, these are just as today, there's some properties that, look, they relaunched Spider-Man. If we want to find a modern day equivalent, they made three really successful Spider-Man movies with Tobey Maguire in the, the leading role. And then they decided, well, we want to do more of these. We didn't kill off the character. He's still there. Tobey's getting a little, little old to play the youthful hero Peter Parker. Well, we'll just start again. <laughs> and they've done this more than once now. They call them reboots. It's a nice euphemism for a rehash. Here's something that I found fascinating that's in line sort of with what we're talking about, and that is you also have a fascination for B movies. Yeah. This to me now, as a film critic, I, I, I've always, 
I, I pictured you in the white ivory tower, Leonard, you know what I mean, before I read the book as the, the academic, you know, who, who, and by the way, you do teach at, at, at uh, what is it, USC? USC. Uh -huh. USC, so you are somewhat of that. But, uh, but when I read your stuff on B-movies and the way you love them is almost as passionately as a classic film. Well, yes, and it doesn't mean that I can argue that they're good in every case, <laughs> but I find the whole the whole aura surrounding B movies of of years past fascinating. First off, got to do a definition. A B movie isn't a cheap movie. A B movie isn't a bad movie. A B movie isn't a cult movie. The literal definition of B movies comes from the era of the double feature in the 30s and 40s and drifting into the 50s. Uh, d during the Depression, the 1930s, studios and theater owners had to give people the illusion, at least, that they were getting more for their money. Hence the double feature. Not that it hadn't been tried before, but they became more regimented at that time. Uh, I mean, are you going to spend your 10 or 15 or 25 cents when it might buy a loaf of bread or something to go to a movie? Well, a lot of people did. They needed that escape. So they started making movies especially for the second half of the double bill. But they were pretty canny about it. All the studios started B-movie units that made cheaper, shorter, less distinguished, shall we say, movies. That's where all the series movies came from. Charlie Chan, uh, uh, Mr. Moto, um, later, you know, Mom, Pa, Kettle, uh, Francis the Talking Mule. Uh, those, those are later in the 50s. But uh, uh, Boston Blackie, uh, uh, the Bowery Boys, they did all these films, and they, they were sometimes 65 or 70 minutes long. That's all. Just enough to qualify as a feature. They really became, those films led to television. Oh, that's They're, what I was going to just say, because... The Bowery Boys, that's where I discovered them. Mm -hmm. They were on television. Of and course. you have a whole chapter in this book about how television, it, it almost revived so many of the, you mentioned Buster Keaton before, yep. so many of the old stars from Gloria Swanson, you name it, they came back and television now became the third wave after the silence, after the talkies, right. the television. It, was, it rescued a lot of careers. It certainly paid a lot of you know, uh, mortgages and rent bills uh, and g provided work. And when you think about filmed television, in those days, in the 50s and, and 60s, they used to do as many as 39 episodes a season. 39 episodes, not 12, <laughs> not 18, not 22, 39. And then that left 13 weeks left over for either reruns or a summer replacement show. This is, this is the early days of television. Seems so distant now. But, uh, so there was lots and lots of work. And a lot of older actors, both famous ones and not so famous ones, found employment. Now, one of the things that you did when you were starting your publishing and then even later on, it was your interviews. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm blessed. We do a little segment, and I checked with you already. We do a segment that will appear immediately after this show mm -hmm. and folks you can just find it at barrykibrick.com it's called our afterwards feature when you're going to do some interviewing of me yeah. and back and forth we're going to swap some stories but you talk about that in the pre-internet days how difficult it was to even get research on the people you wanted to go and interview yeah well i found a new home away from home it was the Lincoln Center branch of the New York Public Library, which is where they have one of the world's foremost collections of books, magazines, still photos, scrapbooks, clippings, you name it, uh, about all of, well, primarily movies, but other aspects of show business too. There's a great dance library there as well. Anyhow, I haunted that place. And, uh, and when I get home to New Jersey that night, or late that day, if I said, oh gosh, I forgot to look that up, 
I was, I was stuck. That's when I started building my own research library. But, but if, you want, if I wanted a list, and I did, of all the films of Burgess Meredith, somebody I interviewed, I had to piece that together by going through, it was, it was an annual book, a huge book called Film Daily Yearbook, which listed year by year what everyone had done. You could look up directors, writers, producers, actors, and piece together, cobble together, you might say, a list or a filmography, as we now call it. You couldn't click onto IMDb and have a ready-made list for you. But in your book, you do something interesting because I've seen you interview the greatest filmmakers, the greatest stars known to, to man. And yet in the book, you purposely, it seems like, put some of the lesser known, mm -hmm. but that had a certain impact. One of them, I, Robert Youngson, you actually say, he changed my life. Now, I must admit, I've never heard of him. Understandably, never was a household name. He was to diehard movie buffs at one time, but never in the general public. He won two Academy Awards for short subjects that he made in the 50s, uh, all looking back, using old newsreel footage uh, on different themes. And he's the man who made that film my parents took me to see called The Golden Age of Comedy. So, Oh, that's how it changed your life. Changed my life. So I got to thank him. I got to meet him and thank him. And uh, what satisfaction that was. And uh, he, was, he befriended me and he was flattered that someone was interested in his career. Now, talk about interested in something. You, you bring back something and you even call it the Forgotten Studio. Yeah. RKO. Mm -hmm. Now, most people still know that name, RKO, but yet they're not doing anything. Yet, yeah. when I looked at it, I didn't even realize they were the ones that did all the Fred Astaire movies, yeah. King Kong, It's a Wonderful Life, and one of the classic films of all time, Citizen Kane. Yeah. And yet, that's a studio that no longer exists and only existed for a relatively brief yeah. period of time. They were, most of the other studios were formed in the silent film era not RKO. RKO was a merger of uh, a unit of RCA, Radio Corporation of America, and the Keith Orpheum Vaudeville Theater Circuit. Well, that's RKO, Radio K -O. yeah. And uh, they kept changing personnel. So just when it had a personality of its own, David O. Selznick was running it when they made King Kong, he left to go to MGM. Big loss. They got another very good producer there, Pandro Berman. He supervised all the Fred and Ginger movies. He left. Then they had a guy came in who was more of an executive, but who had the guts to back Orson Welles and give him carte blanche to make Citizen Kane, and then the Magnificent Ambersons, and then he left during Ambersons, which is why Welles was never able to complete that film as he had envisioned it. So here they end up making some of the most watched films to this day. It's a Wonderful Life plays every Christmas on right. some channel at all right. times. Right. It's a fascinating history. And uh, I had a chance at one time to borrow 16 millimeter prints. I had a projector at home and a basement <laughs> in my parents' home. And I would screen films. I had a chance to borrow prints of a lot of rare and obscure RKO movies, and I couldn't get enough of them. And so I have this compilation of sort of capsulized reviews. When you find these reviews, do you review the reviews? <laughs> I'm well, sorry, I, I know that sounds funny. Well, but. I went back and reread what I'd written, because these all appeared in my, my magazine, Film Fan Monthly, oh. and some of them are 40-ish years old. So I did a little brushing up of some of the uh, a little syntax here, fix, you know, <laughs> oh, something like that. You are a true joy. I, I just thank you so much for being here, and I can't wait for us to chat a little bit later again, but it's a pleasure, sir. It's thank fun you. to talk to you. Thank you, Barry. Oh, and thank you all for joining us. Remember, immediately following this episode, you can catch our afterwards features. This time, Leonard asks 
his favorite talk show host the questions. No, just kidding. Go to my website at www.barrykibrick.com. But before that, I'd like to leave you with these words from Hooked on Hollywood by Leonard Moulton. Fortune smiled on me, and I was able to make a living as a freelance writer and author. Some years after that, I stumbled into a television career. But every now and then, I longed for the complete freedom of writing whatever pleased me, with no one looking over my shoulder and second-guessing my decisions. I'm Barry Kibrick. It seems like many of us nowadays have different careers throughout our lifetime. Between them, all we may not find complete freedom, but be on the constant search for as much as you can find, because that is the only way to make it through the muck and mire of life. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you again. To become part of the Between the Lines family, go to barrykibrick.com. There you can join our book club, participate in Q&As, catch past episodes, listen to Barry's podcasts, read his blog, and experience exclusive online features, all at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses. From podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more. With tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. <laughs>